be the first time I've ever touched an eight. <laughs> you, you take these for granted, but this is pretty special to me. I'm looking at them like, wow, so that's how that works. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> All right. Um, Steve, that was awesome. Yeah. yeah. That was just awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, first thing I want to do, my name's Dave Halsey, and I'm in the Band of Brothers group, and we're a bunch of guys that actually met playing basketball. <laughs> and uh, it's just amazing how, you know, I went my whole life not really letting anybody know who I was and not really knowing anybody. And Steve's testimony is just a perfect example of how that fellowship can really be an instrument to transform our hearts and open up. And, um, you know, Steve, we probably played for, you know, what, a year together, six months. And, you know, Steve was just a guy. I, I had no idea. And uh, I was just a guy to Steve. And after getting to know him and sharing that fellowship and just opening up to each other, he really is a brother of mine, as well as all these other guys. And he has really changed my life and everything he's gone through. He's been an inspiration to all of us, and there's a lot more to come. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, the other thing I want to do is kind of brag. My mom and dad, who are celebrating their 46th wedding anniversary, actually drove all the way up from Rochester Hills just to see their son today. <laughs> they can't watch me play baseball or anything like that anymore, so this is the best I can do for them. <laughs> Can I throw a shout out to my wife's best friends and my best friends, Paul and Gail, who also came to see us, right behind me. Um, today, I am actually going to be talking about the, so, uh, the anchor of the soul, which is hope. Okay? And what I've done, if any of you uh, listen or watch Joyce Meyer, I'm actually, I've actually adopted this from one of her talks. And when I was listening to her, this picture came up in my head, and that's what it ended up. When I put it all on paper, that's what, that goes to show you how screwed up I am in the mind. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> but um, the one thing I do want to do is recognize all of you today for stepping out and finding out what God has to offer for you today. Because I'll tell you, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt in this room, there's a lot of hope and joy in this room. We're all in different places, and it's awesome that God meets us where we are. But there's also a lot of people out there that need to be here right now, that are having pity parties, um, that are going through issues and cycles of behavior that they can't, they're can't, they stuck in and they can't get out of. And the only way to heal and transform a heart is through Jesus Christ. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. I'm going to try, I'm going to have to improvise a little because this slide actually builds. It starts and builds up and I talk through it. So I'm going to remember, I'm going to try to memorize where I start and where I end here. Um, the first thing I want to do is talk about this piece right here. These three circles. The soul, the spirit, and the body. It's pretty amazing that um, psychiatrists and motivational speakers and authors of books have made billions and billions of dollars discovering something that's been in the Bible for over 3,000 years. <laughs> that we are made of a soul and a body and a spirit, and those things must work together for us to be in harmony and in community with God. And you'll hear a lot of New Age stuff out there about, you know, chemicals in the brain causing this, or, boy, there's something beyond us that we can't explain. Maybe aliens dropped us off here. I don't know what it is, but everyone's trying to figure this out. It's like, read the book. <laughs> Seriously, why are you making, people are making a lot of money off of this. So uh, we've got these three things working together for us. We've got the soul, all right? That's really our being. Okay, that's where we make decisions. It's our will, it's our mind, and it's our emotion. Uh, we also have a conscience that God has implanted in every human being uh, since the beginning of time. And that, that conscience allows us to make a choice, and that's the free will that's, that Steve talked about. Uh, our soul is not where God is, okay? We, we live with God in the spirit, which is actually part of our soul, but it's 
the part of the being that we actually have to tune into. So if you think about the spirit, think about a radio. Remember the old boombox radios? You're trying to dial into the channel. See the younger ones. I'm glad you sent them downstairs because they wouldn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but the spirit is really static for a lot of people because it requires an actual tuning of a dial to get the right frequency that God's put within us to communicate with him. So it doesn't happen automatically. Now we got the body down here, that's the third part. And the body, I mean, it's really important. There's a lot of good things that come from the soul and the body because, number one, the, the, what we actually need, and this is the other interesting part, we think we need a whole lot more than we do. But in terms of the body, God tells us all we need is food, water, shelter, and clothing, and I will provide that to you. And he does, and he does it through people. Um, other than that, there's pleasure, right? Um, and pleasure can be good, and it can be used for bad. You know, we can go exercise and take care of our bodies, and that's a good thing. But if our exercise and our training becomes the most important thing to us, and we become obsessed with it, it turns into a bad thing. So we all know, I don't need to give any more examples, because all of you know the type of pleasures that are good for you and the type of pleasures that are bad for you, and it's different for everybody. The interesting thing is society wants us to believe the world, and I'll say the enemy, wants us to believe that we can find happiness on our own. That we can do anything on our own. All it takes is willpower. Uh, and the body. That by feeding the body, this will bring us happiness. Okay? Again, there's people making a lot of money on this model right here. It's a lie. It's a complete lie. But that's what the world and society wants us to believe. Um, the other thing I want to talk about here is down in the right-hand corner. Um, one way that God gave us a barometer check to tell us if we're abusing this gift that he gave us is called the acts of the flesh. It's what is the output of our life um, and what's happening as a result of our actions. So God gives us some markers and says, listen, if this kind of stuff is going on in your life, you're spending way too much time here. And you're not directing it to me. You're, you're becoming self-reliant. Um, as a matter of fact, here's another thing about society. Society says that the more you fill up these circles, the more fulfilled you'll become. But it's actually the opposite. You know, and God tells us it's only through emptying ourselves that we will find true joy and happiness and hope, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And, you know, I've actually been touched by um, anxiety and depression personally, but uh, have gone through some uh, situations with friends that have committed suicide and are going and are in a very uh, dark place. And really, when that happens, when someone gets to that point, it's an absence of hope. It's a complete absence of hope. And it's actually not an absence of self. It's a full of self. Because when the more we fill ourselves up with ourselves, I mean, Sigmund Freud figured this out. He said the more we fill our ego and try to satisfy our ego with pleasure, the more we'll actually hate ourselves. Which is kind of amazing. Because it's completely opposite of what the world tells us. But psychiatry has figured out, in the Bible 3,000 years ago, that... The result of self-fulfillment and self-love is actually despair and destruction. Okay? So the soul, we're going to talk about the soul a little bit. The soul is what I want, what I think, and what I feel. And the question why. I'm going to, oh, I want to talk about the question why. It's a terrible question. We should never use that question unless we really want to learn something. The only time why is a good question is if we want to discover something. How many times do we say, why is my life like this? Why is she treating me this way? Why am I in pain all the time? Why does God let this stuff, these bad things happen? And if we walk away with that, with that question without genuinely trying to seek the answer to it, it's a terrible question. And it's one that's going to just result in a circle of frustration. But the question why comes from our soul. We're, we're created to ask the question why, but we're 
at, we want to ask the question why to actually go out and learn something, not to just dwell on the why and leave it that way. So the problem is that we spend too much time in the soul. Now, I'm going to go up to the spirit. And this is where we live with God. It takes faith to live in the spirit, a belief in something unseen. Hope is taking that faith a little bit deeper. It's an assurance that no matter what happens, I know how this is going to end, and I know that God has my best interests at heart. Hope requires something that we're not good at. Patience. <laughs> because we are programmed to ask for something and expect something back right away. God is programmed to give us what we need at the time that he thinks we need it. And we have a really hard time getting that. Um, the beautiful thing of all this is if you look at the top, this top part here, fruit of the Spirit is a barometer of spirit living and the time that we're spending with God where he lives in the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. So God, once again, has given us a tool to let us know that here are some markers. If these markers are in your life, you're living with me. You're pursuing me. You're being patient with me. But again, if these markers are happening in our life, something's messed up. Something's broke. And we are all broken. So we're going to... We're going to get down in that sometimes. You know, we're, our sinful nature wants us to pull us down into that area. And that's why this thing is so darn important. Because if we don't have hope as the anchor of our soul, we're going to drift off and we're not going to come back to where we started or where we need to be. A couple examples. Genesis 15 talks about... Um, God's promise to Abraham. And God had already done some amazing things in Abraham's life. But yet, Abraham was really up there in age. And so was his wife, Sarah. And they had never received the promise of children. And Abe was getting very, very frustrated. And he was hiding in his tent, moping and groping, probably looking in a mirror at himself, you know, wasn't, things weren't happening for him, okay, let's just put it that way. And he was feeling down on, down on himself, not only that, but he was worried that um, people were going to be taking his possessions and his land and like everything was falling apart. And then the voice of God came forward and said, Abraham, come out of the tent, step out of the tent where I, where I am. He stepped out of the tent to find out what God wanted him to see. And God told him to look at the sky. It was nighttime. Look at the sky and look at the stars. And Abraham, I promise you that your descendants will be greater than the number of stars that you can see in the sky. I will multiply you and I will bless you. By the way, in... Uh, Hebrews 6.13, I wanted to read this really quick. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. I find that really funny. <laughs> that he didn't need to put his hand on a Bible or anything like that. It's, like, there's, it's me, I swear, trust me. <laughs> and he said, I surely bless you and give you many descendants. So he said, I'm going to multiply you. And that promise was for Abraham at the time, but that promise is for all of us. So God made a promise. God can't break promises. He's the absolute of truth. So when God makes a promise, he can't go back on his word. So after waiting patiently, so Abraham waited long and endured patiently. Waited long and endured patiently. Abraham received what was promised. So God did this so that by two unchangeable things, which is the blessing and the multi multiplying you, by two unchangeable things, 
which is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. We have this hope for the anchor of our soul, firm and secure. So basically, let's go back to the picture. What God is saying is, Abraham, you, me, if you step out and find out, I am not going to let you down. It may not look the way you think it's going to look, but God will never, ever, ever fail us if we step out and find out what he has in store for us. It may be something very big. It may be something very small. But he will never, ever fail you. Same thing happened with Peter. I won't go too much into that just for the sake of time. But those are two examples of stepping out in faith and in hope. But the truth of the matter is, here's the, here's the rational side of things. And how, how messed up <clears throat> Satan has gotten us as a society and how broken this world is. So, if we believe in God and we believe Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of our life, and God is incapable of lying, and when he makes a promise, it will come true for us, and we know that if we step out where God lives, that we will get this, why aren't we doing this like every minute of the day? Why aren't we living this way? So, what I wanted to shift to is what God did in terms of giving us a little bit of a prescription for how we do that and what that looks like in our life. So, Jesus said the two greatest commandments are loving God and then loving others. He made it really simple for us. There were ten, but he said the greatest is loving God first and having him as the center of your life. And then the second and greatest commandment is loving others. He, he tried his very best just to speak our language. <laughs> it's something we can understand. Um, so how, what does that look like? How do we go about doing that? Well, the Bible says that we should pray always and never stop being thankful. Okay. And I wrote a little note about that. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep this very simple. Religion Religion, religion's a dangerous world, and you know there's a, been a lot of Christians and a lot of religions, and even us at times that have kind of made God look bad. Um, but really, we need to understand the definition of religion. My definition of religion is standing on our head, on our head to please God. But the truth is that God already stood on His head for us. Okay. So we've all been caught up in that trap of following rules and trying to please God and our good deeds outweighing our bad, but that was never God's intention. He wants us to honor Him and obey Him, but thankfulness is a prayer that says, no matter what my circumstances are, I'm thankful for what you did for me. That gives me hope. Prayer is another thing, worship and prayer. And I'm just going to challenge everybody here, and I'm going to I'm going to call us all out that we a lot of time don't understand what prayer is. Um, if we're in a relationship with God, and we really want to enjoy that relationship, because after all, what God has promised for us is a an awesome adventure and an awesome journey here on earth, the kingdom on earth which we get hung up on salvation and making the cut to get to heaven sometimes. And just our human nature says, man, am I in or am I out? How am I looking today, God? That's a terrible way to live. <laughs> um, and that's why being thankful for what God already did for us is so important because we can always start there. Um, but prayer is a relationship. So let me give you an example. I'm married, I've been married for 22 years now. If I went to my wife every day and told her what I needed all the time, and never listened to her, and never honored her, and worshipped her in the way that she needs to, needs for me. How how do you think that relationship would go? Not good. Not very good at all. She'd be running real quick. 
She tried a couple times, but I, I got the anchor. I anchored her back in. <laughs> but uh, what kind of relationship is that? We got to stop asking for stuff all the time. I mean, it's so easy to get into prayer with God and say, God, thanks for this beautiful day and my friends and this food I'm about to eat. By the way, I need you to fix this arm and I need you to get me a promotion at work and uh, I need you to do this for that person, this for that person. Hey, it's not that God can't handle it, all right? <laughs> He's not getting overwhelmed. He, he wants to answer all of our prayers. But it's really, I'm talking about our responsibility when we pray to God. We need to pursue a relationship with God and practice the presence of God in our prayer as if he's sitting next to us in a chair with his hand on our shoulder. So let's start our prayers with God. I'm so thankful for what you did for me, how powerful you are and what you're doing in the world today and that you have set aside a place for me and my family. And uh, you're just awesome. You're such an awesome part of my life. And, and uh, let's be honest with God. God, here's how I'm feeling right now about you because we're not always, sometimes we're not always good with God. You know, it's like, God, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm praying, but I'm a little upset. I got a few things I need to get off my chest, all right? So I'm going to tell you how I feel, you know. I, I'm not going to point the finger at you, but I'm really confused, okay? And maybe through this prayer you can help me out. That's being real. When we're in a relationship with someone, we need to be real. You know, and that's what we really try to do with our band of brothers. We're not perfect at it, but when people are real with other people and we get real with God, we're in relationship. And that's what, that's what uh, the message is all about in the gospel. God's living word. I'm going to be a little provocative here again. But Joyce Meyer said it. By the way, if this isn't going well, just go to our website. There's a complaint. Uh, it's, it's a lot of material. <laughs> If it really is going well, there's a lot of things I changed that I didn't agree with that she said. <laughs> 66 books, over 40 authors, written over 1,500 years by eyewitnesses that were there to record the events. If, if you ever studied or looked at what was done to preserve this message and how reliable the Bible is, it would blow you away. It is the most accurate, reliable, uh, archaeological, historical book in the history of the world. Nothing even comes close to it. Books that were written, um, um, Homer, the Iliad, things like that, that people just hold up as, oh, you know, this is historical, this is true. They don't even, the number of manuscripts that they have to back this up, their writings aren't even close to the Bible. No other ancient book comes close to the historical reliability and accuracy of this book. Oh, and by the way, it works. You know, it, when applied in your life, it works. So I'm just going to say what Joyce Meyer said. If you're not using this book as the tool, the sword of the spirit for your life, you're choosing to be stupid. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. And you know what? I have droughts. I'll be honest with you. I have droughts where it's like, man, I haven't been in the word. And all of a sudden these things start creeping up. I can feel my heart kind of the, the black matter is starting to crawl into my heart and take over again. And this is, this is good medicine right here. A lot of people try to medicate with other things. This is it. This is what the doctor ordered. Okay. I'll say, take, take one Bible and call me in the morning. You know, that's true. Hey, give it a shot. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to wrap this up right now. Uh, just one thing I want to do is a little illustration. Steve, why don't you put a rope on this for me? You didn't ask me to. <laughs> you said find me an anchor. <laughs> I want, you know, as I'm doing this, I want you to think about what's going on right here in your soul and in your body. And what kind of things, what are your thoughts on a daily basis? And uh, what are the voices going on in your head right now, you know? Uh, my wife, she's always asking me to do stuff. Or, man, my husband, he looks like he's gained about 40 pounds. He's losing his hair. I, what are, you know, what's going on here? Uh, oh, my job, my job. I can't believe I have to get up in the morning again and go to work. This stinks. Uh, oh, here's one. Here's one for you, David. My pastor, he's just not feeding me the way I need to be fed. <laughs> I don't like that music either. They need to start going to some more traditional music. And what are they doing asking for money all the time? I mean, come on. 
It's not like I got money falling out of the tree at home or whatever. <laughs> Listen, my advice to you is if you want a revival, go out and start one. Amen. Go out and start one on your own. Don't wait for your pastor. Don't wait for someone else to come through for you. That's not how relationships work. If you wait for someone to come through for you, you will be disappointed. I guarantee it. Because we will disappoint you. We will. So think about that circle of the soul, where you're at. And then, look at this. we got an anchor to pull us back. And you got some tools here. It's all in the Word. God gave us some tools to pull us back to shore, to where we need to be. And by the way, you get to experience all that great stuff up there in the right-hand corner instead of that crap down there. So where are we at? What do we want to do? I like living up there. That's where I want to be. Um, fellowship. Steve talked about fellowship. It is critical. Um, the church itself was never the intent of Jesus. Jesus didn't want big churches. He never talked about big churches. You know what they did? What did the disciples do? They met with a couple people at a time. They met in small groups. That's church. You come here and you get your playbook, right? You're in the huddle here, and this is great. You've got to be here getting the Word of God. But you've heard this before. Church is what happens when you leave the building. All right, so David and the team here, they're going to kind of get everyone in a huddle and say, all right, we're going to run the uh, right sweep, and uh, I need you over here, you over here, you over here. You get put your hands together and break. Well, after that, it's up to all of us to go out and, and get it done. Okay? The word gospel starts with G-O for a reason. It means go. Go do something. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to have a clipboard um, because I have a... Um, a book through Kensington, oh, a bunch of them actually, a box full of them. It's called Christian Redefined. And it's an awesome small group study. Even I can run one of these uh, because it does all the work for you. And uh, basically what it talks about is the definition of Christianity and kind of how that's been tainted over time and what does it mean to be a Christian. What does the word disciple actually mean? And changing hearts uh, of people that maybe have been hurt by the church or have a perception um, and haven't come back or they're just really struggling with what does all this mean. So it's kind of a boot camp for Christians and it's really an effective group. I'm going to be over here. If you, your heart feels like, you know what, it's time for me to get out of my tent, step out of my boat, find out what God has planned for me, do something about it. If you, if you want to lead a small group, I'd like to connect with you because I can help you, show you the tools and kind of how to get started. And if you'd like to participate in a small group, it could, it could be a couple small group. It could be just for men, just for women. Um, I've got tons of materials here, and uh, it's a lot of fun as well. So I'm just going to put out a challenge right now, you know, that maybe you've been sitting idle for a while, you've been more passive than you need to be, and it's time to connect in community because that's where your hearts are really going to change. Uh, come see me. I'll get your name, email, and I'll make sure to stay in touch with you and kind of help walk you through it so you don't feel like you're on your own doing this. But that fellowship component um, is just so important. Now at the very end, see what Steve talked about with family, friendship, and fellowship, and generosity and service? I don't even need to talk about those things because when we're spirit living, they just happen naturally. It doesn't feel like a job anymore. It's just, this is what I do because God loves me and I want to share this now. So um, you don't have to force it. You know, I used to, I used to be a little honorary about giving and stuff like that. and until I realized why we actually give. It's to give because someone saved my life, and I want to, I want to repay that, Jesus Christ. So with that said, uh, it's 1130. Let's go have lunch or whatever we do next. Or what, we got another half hour to go, David. <laughs> but thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.